Book One, The Forest at the Edge of the World, Chapter 11. So, I've actually rendered you speechless. It feels like a year since we've last spoken. Captain Shin's voice was low and earnest. I never thought two and a half weeks could feel so long. I thought maybe the custom here was to bring more flowers to renew an acquaintance. Mari blinked, then blinked again to make sure she saw everything properly. Yes, that was him standing in the doorway, and that was her still holding the door open, strangely paralyzed. The captain leaned toward her, waiting for a response. She recovered just enough to stiffly answer, Yes, hello, yes, it has been some time. She simply couldn't think of what to do next. It wasn't every day a man stood at her door. Actually, a man was never at her door unless he was there to clean a clog in her water pumps or scrub at her chimney. They both stood there uneasily for a moment until he slowly presented her the flowers. Am I doing this right? Mari felt a slight knock to her mind and said, Oh, of course, yes, thank you, I'll take those. She did, thinking they could replace the dried stem still in her tall mug, but continued to hold open the door dumbly. So, I suppose I'll leave you now, unless you'd like to talk. I have some time tonight, he hinted. Mari rolled her eyes. Please, Captain, do you have a jug you can hit me with? I can't seem to think straight right now. He grinned in such a way that Mari finally understood the meaning of the phrase, feeling faint and fancied. He held up his other hand. Actually, I do. New berry juice to share with you, not the Denzels. And it's Perrin, remember? She smiled back. I'm trying, really. Please, come in. You are trying, he teased. And now I see it's berry juice that gets me in the door, not flowers. I thought maybe mead was more appropriate, he explained as he entered the gathering room, the area shrinking in relation to his height. But no one's ever sure of the strength. And in case I brought the wrong thing, I didn't want to look like that I was trying to, um... He rubbed his forehead, looking for a graceful exit. Mari squinted, trying to figure out where the rest of the sentence may have been headed. When he didn't say anything, she decided a polite host should help. I don't enjoy mead. I saw enough students at the university and Mount Scene drinking the wrong distillations. I couldn't understand why they'd voluntarily give up their ability to think clearly. Perrin smiled. Exactly. I was always the odd man out when everyone else enjoyed their days off in a stupor. But I wanted to be ready when the call came. As they say in the army, you don't want to be caught with your trousers. He stopped, searching her face to see if she knew the phrase he nearly uttered. Her curious and innocent look must have told him she didn't know his meaning. He wasn't about to explain. Caught off guard, he salvaged. He sighed and looked around him for the first time, staring at the number of bookshelves in the room. Really, I'm so sorry about not letting you in right away, Mari explained as she set the flowers down on the eating room table. She should have put them in the mug in her kitchen, but she didn't dare leave, just in case the captain vanished while she was gone for two minutes. Besides, she wasn't ready to replace the dried up stems he gave her three weeks ago. I was just so surprised to see you there. I wasn't expecting, but, but I'm glad you've come. Please sit down. She gestured to a stuffed chair her mother bought her when she moved into her small home. But he didn't move. Instead, he cocked his head to look at the shelves, reading the titles carefully burned into the leather spine bindings. How did you get so many books? They must have caught a, cost a small fortune. It cost my father a small fortune, Mari told him. I inherited them when he passed away. Mother didn't want them, except for one about embellishments through the ages. I must confess I haven't read all of them yet, but I plan to. May I borrow some? Some of these titles are old. All I could find in Idemia are new writings and ideas, but I find there's more truth in the there's more truth in most of the old writings. Don't you agree? He turned to Mari with the eagerness of a young student. Something in her chest burned again. Of course, borrow whatever you want. Take home an armful before you leave. Trying to get me out the door already? Perrin asked. She didn't notice the twinkle in his eye. 
No, stay as long as you wish tonight. His eyebrows rose in astonishment at her insinuation. She still missed the teasing in his eyes. No, that's not what I meant. Maury backtracked in a panic. She knew this is why she usually didn't talk to men. I am not implying any impropriety. As soon as she said the words, she was even more mortified. Oh, no, no, no. What I mean is, stop. Perrin laughed. Stop. He actually laughed. And it cleared Maury's mind completely. It sounded like bells. I know what you mean. Don't worry. He extended his hand as if to take her arm, but pulled it clumsily back instead. Ah, but you're so easy to tease and fluster. I can't help but wonder why. When we were on the platform, I found it very difficult to shake your confidence. You gave me the greatest challenge I've had in many years. And that was in front of thousands of people. But when we're alone, his voice quieted, you can't seem to string a coherent thought together. That's not exactly a compliment, is it, Mari said, pursing her lips. You're doing better now, recovering some of your intelligence. She saw the teasing twinkle in his eye that time. I'm just better able to deceive you now. I'm still incoherent, but I can mask it when I have a few moments to prepare, she confessed. He sighed. I don't think you could ever deceive me, but I'll confess I've deceived you. He looked around for the stuffed chair. He gestured to Mari to sit in its match across from it, and he sat down after she did. How have you deceived me? Mari dreaded to hear. She wondered if her father would still like him. She felt a warm touch just above her heart again, and she braced to hear just about anything as long as it wasn't about a wife and Itamia. He placed his elbows on his knees and leaned forward, putting his hands together. I've deceived you by not being completely honest. I guess I've been testing you. Testing? Why? I came to the village because I requested this assignment. You see, he leaned forward in his chair closer to Murray. She could almost smell him, but she didn't dare get closer especially if what he was about to say would make her hate him. You see, he repeated hesitantly, looking into her eyes, I worried about the ideas I saw emerging in Idemia. I wanted to find a place that would reinforce my belief in the writings. Yes, I do believe in the writings, despite what I said at that second debate. I hope I prove that in the fourth. In many ways, your mind is like this is the same as mine. But the writings and beliefs in Idemia are dying, and new suggestions are spreading. The suggestions will be mandates soon enough, I'm sure. His tone hardened, and he looked down at his hands. You see, the administrators... He stopped abruptly and looked up into her face, as if fear fearing he had just revealed a secret. Mari held her breath as a fantastic idea filled her. Suddenly, everything in the last half hour, the last several weeks, was making sense. He was skeptical, too, just like Father. She waited in eager anticipation to hear his evaluation of the administrators. She wasn't about to get it. I looked for a village as far away as I could. He instead continued on a safer path, hoping to find a place where I could continue believing. My great uncle has written me a lot about Edge. When the new need arose for a new fort, I had my reason to leave, and the general approved my request. I guess I've been testing to see just what the people here think, what you think. He looked down at his hands for a moment. My mother says I have a tendency to stir the pot, he said with a small chuckle. She's always warning me about behaving. He looked up her again, up at her again. I realize I haven't always been honest. And I certainly wasn't fair with you. I'm sorry about that. Can you forgive me? Mari was stunned by even more than his apparent skepticism of the administrators. I never imagined you actually want to be here. That was all you at the fourth debate? Stir the pot. Then she remembered something else. Who's your great uncle? You don't know? Our one-time matchmaker, Hogel Denzel. He's married to my mother's aunt. 
Of course. No wonder Rector Denzel puffed with pride whenever he saw the captain. Perrin's dark eyes softened. He seems so different this evening, but also familiar somehow. He likes you, you know. I'm sure that was obvious a few weeks ago. In fact, he's the one who suggested I debate you the first night. He said he'd make my time here interesting. He chuckled again. I, I actually thought the teacher would be an old spinster. So I'm not old, Murray ventured with a small smile. No, he exclaimed. Then more calmly, he said, no, 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 not at all. I was quite surprised to see someone so, so, he turned a little red. Mari grinned to herself. She flustered him. So, so young and capable, Perrin finally finished. Mari tried not to look disappointed. She was hoping for something a little more than that. Maybe something even bordering on romantic, but young and capable would have to suffice. Perrin appeared frustrated with his words as well. I've missed our debates, he continued, much more than I expected. These past few weeks have been the longest I've experienced since initial training for the Army. I've worked my new soldiers, mapped the region, planned patrols for the forest, and he looked down at his hands again. Ruined more than one report because your name keeps cropping up in my writings. Not exactly efficient. Wait, Mari stopped him. He looked up her expectantly. Wait, how many patrols can a few soldiers on horseback watching the forest have? She asked. Perrin looked disappointed, then surprised. What do you mean, a few soldiers? The full 100 arrived last week. 100? Mari was shocked. The most we ever had in Edge was five. I thought maybe a dozen. But what do you need with 100 men? You didn't see them come in? He sat back in his chair and gestured, disbelieving with his hand. It was a great parade. 100 men in uniform, 25 of them on matched horses. I thought all of Edge came out. He was like a 10-year-old who just figured out how to do a backflip, but no one saw him. I was at the head of all of it, his voice quieted. Really quite something to see. He looked at his hands, which didn't know what to do, but slapped gently against each other. I, I heard the children in school mention something about a parade, but I didn't pay much attention to it, she admitted. I heard some noise out in the road last week, but I just thought it was the musicians marching as they practiced or something. But why 100 men? Where are they staying? He frowned at her. The fort is quite large. We took over the old farm and orchard area to the north, completed the barracks and mess hall just last week. You really didn't notice 100 new soldiers, he persisted. We marched up the road just one house away from here. I'd been busy at home, she said dismissively. Why so big? What are the administrators expecting? Garters, he said solemnly. Oh, of course he'd say that. Mari saw her chance. He wasn't in uniform, so she could ask him about the real threat of the garters. And, it, and there wasn't really anything he could do, officially, about her doubts. If I may ask you something in confidence, Perrin, his eyes brightened. Anything, Mari. Honestly, if there really is that big of a garter threat after all these years, especially here in Edge, it just seems so, so convenient sometimes. All the light dimmed from his eyes. Garters. You're asking me about garters? Yes, garters, she repeated, not understanding his reticence. I lived here all my life and have heard of only two people who supposedly ever saw garters. And one of those witnesses had been drinking old grape juice. Garter activity hasn't been close to edge since Quarrel the First Soldiers chased them to the forest. Perhaps they're still there but they never come to the village. I've even walked along the forest edge myself to see the bubbling mud and have never seen anyone. You also didn't notice when 100 men plus 25 complement, a dozen full wagons, and 25 horses moved in less than a quarter mile away from your home, Perrin countered. Mari paused. You make a good argument, 
she murmured. Mari was never one to look too far beyond her books. She was a woman of the word, not of the world. Still, she continued, doesn't 100 soldiers, or rather 125, seem excessive? The brightness from the previous brightness in his eyes still didn't return. If you knew what I knew, but I, I can't tell you all of it. He sat up straight and looked like a soldier at attention. Mari assumed it was an instinctive stance. The administrators, when they came to power, initially attempted to send out scouts to look for new lands to settle. Perrin's voice was careful and calculated. They were headed to the ruins King Quirrell's soldiers had visited many years ago, hoping to discover if the area was still poisoned. Mari sat up eagerly at the mention of Terrap's ruins, but had the wisdom to not interrupt. Their findings were most disappointing. They never reached the ruins. All of the forests surrounding the world on the north and west showed evidence of increased garter activity. One of their spies was apprehended and brought to the High General for questioning. There's no doubt they are moving closer to the smaller villages. We have every reason to believe they're planning to raid places even like Edge. Thus, we've implemented a presence to discourage such activity. Mari sat at attention, trying not to show her disappointment that the scouts never even reached Terrap's land, or that he provided an army-issued explanation. This sounded rather rehearsed. In her most official voice, she said, I thank you for your report, Captain. Perrin's lips parted in surprise, but he quickly closed them. Uh, old soldiers have it to make reports. Sorry. <clears throat> and how old a soldier are you? Maury prodded with a smile, even though she already knew from that one interesting fact in the back of the history book. As old as you, he smiled. Maury wondered how he knew her age. He leaned back in his chair and studied her, resting his head on his fingers. But Maury didn't notice. She had to try one time now that the official report was out of the way. Do you really think these mysterious peoples of violent tendencies, whom we've heard very little from for 119 years, are suddenly coming to evade us here in Edge? <clears throat> His studied look vanished and he shrugged. Sounds a little far-fetched when you put it that way, but yes, I suspect they may. Suspect and may, Mari jumped on his hesitation. Yes, you really are convinced. Is there not any other reason those men, I mean, your man, are here? He leaned forward. For what other reason could there be? I really don't know, Mari admitted, suddenly feeling chilled. But as you spoke, even the air seemed to change. Didn't you feel it? Perrin sighed. Conflict always brings an odd feeling. Even preparing for a conflict that never comes changes the air around it. I don't like it, Mari, but I like even less what a full battle would mean to this village, or to you. Mari swallowed. Something in the way he said her name and then said you felt very intimate. Then she remembered something. Ruins! You mentioned something about ruins, Captain. Will they be sending another scouting mission? once the garter threat is put down again. Perrin looked a little annoyed, and Mari didn't know why. The ruins. That's what you want to talk about now? The ruins. Yes! I've always been fascinated by those who lived there before we did. Just imagine! They've already gone through and completed the test. Terrap had spent so much time... Terrap, he interrupted her and squinted in surprise. I remember you mentioned him in the fourth debate. But just how much do you know about Tarab? Mari rolled her eyes. The greatest historian of the Middle Age, the one who studied the great ruins beyond the deserts west of Sands, I think I know all there is to know about Tarab. More than just his stories, his discoveries. When I was a girl, I used to fantasize about his expedition to the, after the Great War. My father and I would hypothesize about what he discovered, what might have been on his map, and why Quarrel didn't want that information known. She stopped in worry, realizing that she was saying too much in front of a man who swore to serve the king 
until the regime change only two years ago. The corner of Perrin's mouth went up. As a girl, you fantasized about a historian who's been dead for a hundred years. He chuckled. You are just full of surprises, aren't you? Mari relaxed at his changed demeanor. I found Tarap far more interesting than stories of girls in distress awaiting rescue. Where's the adventure in that? Sitting around in a tree, hoping some dashing soldier would look up and see her cowering in fear from garters? She scoffed. Pfft. But ruins? Ha oh, ha. Now there's something worthwhile. Mari, he said abruptly and pressed his lips together. She stared at him, startled by his outburst. What? Can we discuss ruins at another time? I suppose so, but what would we discuss instead? She was mystified and a bit put off. I've been thinking about the debates. So have I, Mari grinned. I was thinking when we have time, maybe we can start them again. I have some new arguments for Mrs. Arkey to counter Mr. Arkey with about eating anywhere in the house. The number one reason has to do with ants. Oh, but I shouldn't tell you that. I don't want to give it away. Mari. The solemnity in his voice startled her. He looked at her with such intensity that he clearly wasn't thinking about Arkies or ants. Just let me say this. All right. No more interruptions. By the way his jaw clenched, she decided she best just listen. She gave him a brief nod to continue. He took a deep breath. I haven't been able to get the debates out of my mind or you out of my mind. Mari bit her lower lip. I didn't know what I would find an edge, but I was really hoping to find... He paused, stared at his hands and shook his head. Mari was completely bewildered by his behavior. She really didn't know, man. Honestly, Mari, it was only a little way into that first debate that I thought to myself, I could, I could. He could what? I could love a woman like you, he rushed. He slowly looked up into her face with something like anguish. Mari sat stunned as she ran the words or rather word over in her head to break apart the syllables. I think he said it, she mused. It was too much to hope for, but she hoped anyway. She smiled encouragingly. So you could, could you? Mari, what are you doing to me? He stood up abruptly, but then sat back down again. She'd never seen him like this. The confident captain was nowhere to be found. Instead sat, stood, and then sat yet again, an agitated and now almost pathetic man. I'm sorry, what am I doing? She asked sweetly, but not innocently. She thought briefly that her teenage students would be proud of her composed reaction to this most unexpected conversation. He put his hands together and rested his elbows on his knees. One leg began to bounce nervously. I feel I can no longer create a coherent sentence. Maybe we need an audience. He stood again, walked around the chair, and used it as a buffer to stand behind. He put on a look of resolution and blurted, Mari, I don't want to get married. Definitely unexpected. Her heart dropped through the floor. To a woman who cannot think or take a challenge, the only kind of woman I could ever marry, her heart lifted back up to just above her belly, is a thoughtful woman who can hold her own in a conflict. I need someone who believes just as strongly as I do. Her heart hovered. He meant her, right? He was talking about marrying and suggesting her in the same sentences. How did they get here? But another thought struck her, and she knew what she had to say, yet she couldn't believe she'd utter the words until she did. But Perrin... I don't think I believe the same as you, she said miserably. So many things we debated, we were on opposite sides. Except for the fourth debate, Rector Denzel gave you my position. Otherwise, no, 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 he cried and came around the chair to sit back down to face Mari. He leaned forward earnestly and was so close she could breathe in his earthly sweet scent. 
She struggled to concentrate. Don't you remember, he pleaded. I've told you twice now. Your mind is closer to mine than you realize. We are so alike. You defended every argument the way I would. I argued ideas, but not always my ideas. I never believed the sky is only blue. In fact, the more I think about it, the more I'm convinced it truly is black and that the blue is an illusion. And that fourth debate, that's when you finally heard how I really feel. I told Hogel I wanted that position so that I could try to prove to you that I do believe in the writings. I agree with you on everything, except dogs. Dogs are far better than cats. Sometime during his speech, Mari's heart leaped to her throat, making it very difficult for her to breathe. So she just hoped for what might come next and hoped she wouldn't lose consciousness waiting. Perrin gathered her small, soft hands into his large, rough ones. The effect caused Mari to lose all ability to speak had she been able to breathe. <clears throat> Mari, what I want to say is, he began, staring at their hands together. Why I am here is, he looked up into her face. You can see the direction all of this is going, right? Mari was sure she could, but she didn't feel it was her place to make this any easier. She smiled and shook her head. Besides, her lungs still couldn't function and everything was starting to go gray. He took a deep breath, closed his eyes and said, Mari, may we continue our debates forever as husband and wife? He peeked to gauge her response. At least she thought he did. Her eyes were too full of astonished tears to see him clearly. She nodded vigorously. Really? Perrin asked, immense relief in his voice. You, you don't want to have time to think about it? She thought briefly. She didn't want to think about it. Inexplicably, she felt no reservations. None at all. Instead, she felt a great surge of peace and thought of how her father would approve. Somehow he was behind all of this, she was sure. Mari shook her head just as vigorously as she'd nodded it. So I've actually rendered you speechless, Perrin grinned. Yes, yes you have, Mari shouted. No, no I haven't, I see, Perrin laughed. But I think I know how to keep you from speaking. He stood up and pulled her up too. He released her hands and moved his up to hold her face. Mari panicked. She'd never kissed a man before, besides her father, and judging by the spark she saw in Perrin's eyes, she was fairly confident he was not expecting a quick peck on the cheek. As he bent closer to her, she trembled. Wait, she exclaimed. Wait, I don't know what I'm doing. Perrin stopped just inches from her face. What? She scramped, squirmed. I really don't know how to do this. I've never kissed a man before. Mari suspected this conversation wasn't going right. Perrin relaxed, probably expecting to hear something worse. Well, neither have I. He smiled and cocked his head. Understand, he began patiently, but she took a nervous step back anyway as he kept his hold on her. I haven't exactly spent the last few years doing this every day either, but I do know a few things, he continued, and well, I'm, I'm trying to kiss you for the first time, and, and do you begin with a warning? Frustration grew in his eyes, dimming the spark. I thought you should know, she whimpered. He narrowed his eyes and slowly said, I am trying to make you stop talking for just one moment. I know, Mari bellowed and bit her lip nervously. The longer she looked at him, the worse she felt. She was going to lose him. She could feel it. Perrin released her face and stepped back to study her. This, this is unexpected. Mari cringed and wrung her hands. A first kiss was supposed to be instinctive and genuine, not, not this. She looked up at Perrin and realized that he was as nervous as she was. How long had he been preparing for this moment and she knocked him off his course? Well, she had no preparation at all. He pressed his lips together and continued to analyze her. 
Mari knew then that she had ruined it all. Just as she had the most wonderful future in her grasp, she was losing it because, because she was afraid that she didn't know how to do something. Stupid, she told herself. What was she? She didn't get to the end of her mental chastisement. Perrin stepped forward suddenly and wrapped his arms around her before she realized what he was doing. He mashed his mouth against hers before she could think about how to do it. She could think of nothing, clearly, but in the stunned confusion of her mind was a sense of surprised bliss. A few seconds later, he pulled away. Keeping her in his grasp, he whispered, Now, was that so difficult? I'm not sure, she admitted. It happened so fast. Can we try that again? For my future wife, anything, he grinned. I have a feeling life with you will mean anticipating the unexpected, then finding my expectations exceeded in every possible way. That wasn't entirely coherent, she gently pointed out. He sighed. That's just what you do to me. As long as it's only you who knows what power you have over me, I should still be able to maintain my reputation. Sometime during their long second attempt, Mari decided that kissing him wasn't going to be difficult at all. The rest of the evening, they sat huddled together on the small sofa, planning, discussing, and laughing. It felt surprisingly natural, as if they had always been this way. They decided that after such a public courtship, their marriage ceremony should be private and small with only Mari's mother, Rector Denzel, who would perform the ceremony, Tabit Denzel, and Perrin's parents, since the High General was planning to be in the area in about three moons to inspect the fort. To make up for this small ceremony, they decided to have a large celebration afterwards, as was the tradition in Edge, where everyone came with a dish of food to share, along with a piece of useful, useless advice. Perrin left Mari's home that evening, to be his home as well in a season, they decided, since it was relatively close to the new fort, at an appropriate hour and with a stack of books. Noticing the neighbors across the road sitting on their front porch to enjoy the surprisingly warm night air, he announced, Thank you for your information and time, Miss Murray. I'll enjoy reading these books. Murray's neighbors, a middle-aged couple she'd known since she was a child, just smiled and nodded at him. Then they winked at each other. <clears throat> Lieutenant Carnet was in the forward command office, going over the next day's work assignments, awaiting the return of the captain. Frequently, the old sergeant major trotted up the stairs and raised his eyebrows in questioning. No third hole in the office, yet. Wiles would chuckle all the way down the stairs. The fourth time Wiles came up the stairs, looking a bit tired from his journeys, he plopped down on one of the chairs by the large work desk. Phew, now I know why I never married and had children. He took off his cap to smooth his thin gray hair. Waiting up for them is exhausting. Karna grinned. Wiles, I can just let you know when he comes in. Wiles smiled slyly at him. Getting rather late now, Lieutenant. My guess is it's been a successful evening, and he's not coming in until morning. Karna shook his head. The captain's not that kind of a man, Sergeant Major. I know him. He'll be back up here before he retires for the night to brief the night watch. Wiles sniggered and put a boot casually on the corner of the desk. <clears throat> you haven't been in the army as long as I have, Lieutenant. I see now why Chairman Mal himself said my wisdom was needed up here. He puffed up his narrow chest. I suppose if I weren't so wise, I'd been given a position somewhere warmer. But the High General agreed with Mel, and so I'm here to teach all you boys a thing or two. Here's your first lesson. No man is exactly as he presents himself. There's the public man, and then there's the private man. Shin puts up an excellent public front. I've heard he handled himself quite well at those debates, and so far the village seems completely enamored with him. So likely is that lovely young woman. But private, Shin's a man with needs, Lieutenant. 
And when an animal feels a need, he raised his eyebrows and leered. Now you just run along to your quarters. I'll brief the night shift. Shin will be back in the morning. Shin's back right now. The voice booming up from the stairs made both the soldiers jump in their seats. Wiles put his foot back properly on the ground before Captain Shin strode up to the office. He was wearing a black tunic, black trousers, a leather jacket, and a small smile that refused to be suppressed. Karna shot Wiles a look of, I told you so. Shin casually picked up a piece of paper from the desk and glanced at it. Thought I wouldn't be back to do my duty for the night shift, Wiles? No, sir, the sergeant major said. It's just that I, uh, Shin looked at him. Leave the two holes in the wall for now. Rather like them. They're only through the first layer of wall anyway and not the second. And no, there won't be a third hole, Karna. He turned to his lieutenant who had a cautious smile on his face. If you wish, in about three moons, you can move into my quarters. They're a little larger. Karna grinned. And why won't you be sleeping there anymore, sir? Shin tried to keep his smile down, but failed. I think my wife will prefer that I spend my nights at our home instead. Wiles clapped his hands loudly and stood up. Knew it! Well done, Captain! He shook Shin's hand and slapped him on the shoulder. Karna chuckled. Sir, that's, that's good news. Rather sudden, don't you think? Shin's smile faded a little. Uh, well, perhaps... That's why the three moons time, Brillin. I can't wait to hear what the village will say, Karna said. Marrying one of their own? That's certainly a way to win hearts and minds. Karna and Wiles laughed together as Shin reddened. Well, the High General will certainly be impressed, Wiles hinted. Shin went a deeper shade of burgundy. The High General, he stared at the floor. Wiles and Karna shared a look of concern. When do you plan to tell him? Wiles asked quietly. Shin blinked and looked up. Soon, soon. Listen, we'd really like to keep this quiet for a while. I told only the two of you so that you can understand. But please, let us reveal it when the time is right. Of course, sir, Karna answered. Wiles nodded slowly. Captain, I'm glad you told us. Now that she's someone important to you, she may become someone important to the garters. Shin let out a low whistle. I hadn't considered that either. Wiles patted him on the back. We can take care of that, Captain. Soldiers need to start patrolling in the village, too. We'll simply put your future home on the roots. In fact, as an early wedding gift, show me right now where she lives. He pulled out a clean sheet of paper and a piece of sharpened charcoal. We can put her road on the roots. Don't worry, I won't say anything to the soldiers until you want us to, but we'll keep her safe. <laughs> Shin smiled. Thank you, Wiles. That will make me feel better until I'm living there. He started sketching out a rough map of the northern village. She's on the second ring of houses just off the main fort road, barely a quarter mile away from the fort. Well, that's convenient, Karna nodded at the map. And she hasn't even seen the fort yet, Shin said, shaking his head and chuckling, and didn't even know the soldiers came in. I have to give her a tour sometime, I suppose. He made a notation for her house. Doesn't she have a mother, Captain? Wiles gestured to the map. <clears throat> Shin nodded. I've only heard about her, but yes, I better put her mother's on here, too. Just so Mari feels she's protected. Good idea, Wiles. Now, according to the Densels, Mrs. Pato is on the third ring on the other side of the Fort Road, one of these two houses. Both have elaborate gardens, so I'm not sure which. He paused, wondering which house to mark. You're not sure which house is your future mother-in-law's captain? Wiles scowled good-naturedly. Shin paled at the phrase, mother-in-law. Karna covered his grin with his hand while Wiles chortled. We'll just put that entire road on the route and mark both houses. Now that I think about it, isn't your aunt and uncle of yours along that same area? Shin eagerly made some more notations on the map further west. Densels, right there. 
Again, good idea, Wiles. Thank you. Wiles smiled as he took up the map. Just doing my duty, sir. And again, congratulations. You're going to make many people happy. Now I'm glad I'm all the way in the north. I'm beginning to see the appeal. Karna laughed and Shin glared affably at the old soldier. Oh, the old sergeant major. Well, he's an old soldier, too. All right, that is the end of chapter 11. Some kind of romantic music. Da -da 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 -da. No, I can't do it. I just can't do it. Thank you.